world who are thirsty and all who are weak and come to the fountain and dip your heart in the stream of life and let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out too deep and we sing come Lord Jesus come come And all who are weak Who come to the fountain Who dip your heart in the stream Of life and let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy as deep cries out too deep and we sing come Lord Jesus come come Lord Jesus come and come Speed preaching. <clears throat> Daniel 5. If you'll turn there with me. Thank you guys for the music during the off uh, communion. It's beautiful. Bob, thank you. Beautiful song. I can always remember his name. His name is Bob Jones. That's our professor at Bible College. I asked him if he knows Old Testament history. Well, we're going to work on that. His wife is Sue. If you haven't met them, please introduce yourselves. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, we've been going through the, the book of Daniel, and a quick reminder, Daniel, at least the first half or so, if, and all of it actually, but particularly the first half, all the stories, um, are saying the same thing over and over and over again, that God is in control of the affairs of men. Even when it doesn't appear that he is in control, he is in control. And every one of these stories we've been looking at in the first four chapters and now today in chapter five is the same thing. It's, it's to remind us that God is in control. And, and so you might ask yourself, why does Daniel keep repeating it? Because we still don't believe it. We often act like our situation is just beyond him, right? It, it's not. It, it's not that he is unaware at all. Now, he may not be fixing it the way you want it fixed at the moment, but God is still in control, ultimately, of the affairs of men. And today is a day that makes that really hard to, to feel when you think, well, where's God when the shootings take place? I remember E. Richard Smith, who used to pastor here, in fact, this this has green felt on it right here, and uh, it's been here a long time. And these two edges are worn off on both sides, and that's because E. Richard used to hold the pulpit like that when he preached. And I could have replaced that, but I don't want to. I like to see that and remember that. But E. Richard used to tell me, he said there was an accident, I think it was out here on 41, and, and a young person got killed, and the bereaved parents, understandably so, you know, ask Richard at the scene, where was God when my son died? 
And he said, it's obviously from God, it wasn't from me. He said, it just set back the same place he was when his son died, on the throne and in control. It's not, it doesn't fix our answers, does it? I mean, it doesn't give us everything we want to know. But one thing I am certain, God is in control of the affairs of men and women, the world, right? And Daniel keeps repeating that because we need to keep hearing it. And as I've been saying all along, Daniel is great stories. They make great flannel graphs. If you're under 50, I'll explain what that is later. They make great flannel graph stories. And uh, some old preacher was talking about flannel. What's he talking about flannel for? Anyway, but it's more than that. This, to me, is... As I've been saying over and over again, Daniel is the forerunner of where we are now, that we, like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are in a foreign land under the captivity of, of someone who is not the ultimate king. We are in a foreign land, and we are in the realm of darkness, and it makes no difference where we are. We are still supposed to live the light of God in the realm of darkness. That's our call. And the story of Daniel tells us over and over again, even though Daniel, is, God is answering his prayers and saving him in miraculous ways, he's still a slave. We can't forget that reality. Man, I wish God would answer my prayer. I'm thinking Daniel's prayer. I'm thinking, why don't you send me back to Jerusalem? So I'm not a slave, but God didn't fix that. And sometimes we are where we are. Sometimes God does not stop everything from happening for whatever reasons that I cannot tell you. I could make guesses, but I can't tell you. But one thing I know for certain, and Daniel, who should be saying this the least, says it the most, even though I'm in a foreign land and in the realm of darkness under a pagan king, God is still in control of the affairs of men, and he still loves me, and I will be his light in darkness. This story is of Belshazzar, another king, actually probably the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, it is one chapter about him, and it's basically a 24-hour period of time. Belshazzar starts out as king and having a party, and by the end of the night, he's dead. And in the middle, he comes and asks for Daniel. Let's just read a little bit of the story. We're going to have to jump here and there for time this morning. But Daniel 5, verse 1, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. And when Belshazzar tasted the wine, he gave orders to bring the gold and silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem. So these are the sacred, sacred uh, uh, emblems that they were used in temple worship. This, this wasn't Tupperware. This wasn't the stuff that you use for people you don't like. You know, the silverware and stuff. This was God's sacred emblems that were used for, for holy work. And they've been in the temple nearly 70 years now. I mean, out of the temple, but in the holding of Nebuchadnezzar in some chamber, I'm sure, locked up. But Belshazzar, in this drunken state, says, let's bring out the gold and silver vessels, which he took from Jerusalem, in order that the king... And his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. He's trying to make a point. There is no gods greater than me. No rule is greater than me. Look, we got in our temple the emblems of what they call the Almighty God, and we ransacked his country. We took his stuff, and I got it locked up. He must not be a god. If you don't know, I'm going to spoil it. He's about to find out differently. Now, here's what I need you to understand is what this whole thing is about. Well, if God is a God, why did he let his stuff be taken? Well, mostly because of Israel's sin. And it was taken, and God allowed it to be taken. Where was God when his stuff was taken? The same place he always is, is on his throne and in control. But he had a purpose to get done, and it was going to be a 70-year purpose, and that purpose wasn't done. The problem is, when it was sitting in the vault, God let that happen. But tonight, mm -mm. 
This is another one of the Titanic stories. Not even God can sink this ship. That's what Belshazzar is going to do. He said, we're going to drink from them at this party, which means they're nothing. They're just Tupperware, and we're going to show you. Verse 3, they brought out the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem, and the kings and the nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze and iron and wood and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand emerged and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. Do, 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 By the way, there's no body attached to this hand, as far as we can tell. A hand just appears by the lampstand. <clears throat> now, we don't know this for certain, but there are a number of people who have studied this that believe that the lampstand that is being talked about was also one taken out of the vault and brought out with the gold stuff, that it was the menorah that was in the temple of God that was used, the, the, the golden lampstand that would light the temple. And they brought it out to use it as a table fixture and to light it. And it was out of that lampstand and, and the light of God's lampstand that truth was going to be told who was in control. And so out of the opposite place of this lampstand in the light where they could see it a hand appears and starts writing on the wall. And, and the king, Belshazzar, could see only the back of the hand as it wrote. Verse 6, And the king's face grew pale, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack. I understand that. And his knees began knocking together. You know what he thought. Is anybody else seeing this? Or is it just because I'm drunk? Can you see that hand? Can you see that hand? And all thousands could see the hand. And Belshazzar, I imagine, became pretty sober, pretty quick, and began to realize that his parlor trick wasn't probably very smart. The king called aloud, he did what he always did. They, they called the Ghostbusters. That's the first ones they call, right? The Chaldeans, the magicians, and all their best guys, right? And they get them there, and we know the story. We don't have to read it. They get there, and they're like, oh, yeah, you don't know what it means. <laughs> it's party. And uh, they couldn't read it. Now, it's in a language <laughs> that they could, should have been able to read. It's probably in Aramaic, but... For whatever reason, God wouldn't even let them be allowed to read it. They couldn't comprehend what it was about. And maybe it was numero numerological, and they didn't get the message. And so his guys couldn't figure out what was going on. And so they did what they always do. And we're going to jump ahead in the story. Is he's freaking out like, you guys can't read it. No, I can't read it. And finally his mom, the queen mother, it says the queen, but we don't think it's his wife because his wife was already out there. We think the queen mother comes out and says, um, <clears throat> boy. And uh, now it doesn't say she smacked him in the back of the head, but she said, there's a guy in our kingdom that your grandfather realized was special. And then, by the way, in this chapter, they start calling him Daniel instead of Belteshazzar. You remember last chapter is when Nebuchadnezzar got sent out into the wilderness to live like an ox for seven years? until he recognized that God was in control of his kingdom, not him. And ever since that moment, when he really got converted, he started calling him Daniel. Instead of Belteshazzar, I mean, Bel is his God. And Daniel, the Lord is God. He says, there's a guy named Daniel that can probably answer all your questions. So Daniel comes, and he's brought to the king. Verse 13 the king spoke to Daniel and said, Are you the Daniel who was one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father king brought from Judah? I've heard that you've got the spirit of the gods in you. That's the pagan way of describing what was going on. And he goes on and 
he tells them, I just, I just know you can probably fit, help me out. And he says in verse 16, the last part, if you can tell me the inscription and its interpretation, you'll be clothed with purple, which means you'll be a majesty, you'll be high in power. You'll wear a necklace of gold, get some bling around your neck, and you'll have authority as the third ruler in the kingdom. It's probably him and his wife. You weren't going to make him second. He's smarter than that. Me and my wife, and then you're going to be third in the kingdom. I love Daniel. By the way, Daniel was probably in the teenage years or late teens when he got taken, and is almost at the end of 70 years. Daniel's in his late 80s. That's a Wonderful thing about getting older, you can pretty much get away with whatever you want. I just need to act like you don't know what you're doing and they'll just take you home, right? So, um, Daniel says in verse 17, keep your gifts for yourself or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the inscription to the king and make his interpretation known. I'm 88 years old. I don't need your stupid robe. I got all the gold chains I need. You keep all that. You keep all that. I want to... I want us to understand that, as I said when we started this, Daniel's one of the few people in Scripture that nothing negative is ever written about. Didn't show any of his weaknesses. Like, you know he had them, but it doesn't show him here. And it's because the moments we get to see of Daniel are the moments that the Spirit of the Lord is at work in him. And, and we are not the sum of all our mistakes, but we are what God can do in us every day through his Spirit. And we are to be this light that Daniel was in our realm of darkness. So Daniel could have jumped right to what was written, but he doesn't. He he draws the story out a bit in verse 18. O King, the Most High God, granted sovereignty grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar, your father. Now notice the language there. God gave it. God granted it. Your grandfather didn't get it on his own. God gave it to him. And because of the grandeur, verse 9, that he gave him, bestowed on him, all the people's nations, men of every language, feared and trembled before him. He killed who he wanted to kill, granted life to everyone, grant life, and all the blessings that he gave. Verse 20, but when his heart was lifted up and his spirit became so proud that he behaved arrogantly, he was disposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken, taken, it was given and it was taken away from him. He was also driven away from mankind and his heart was made like that of the beast and his dwelling place was with the wild donkeys. He was given grass to eat like cattle and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he recognized that the most high God is ruler over the realm of mankind and he sets over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart even though you knew all of this. You knew. You know the story I'm telling you. You know who I am. You know what happened. You know who God is, and you yet are not living like he is God. Now that's a message for all of us to make sure we're here. We know who God is, and are we living like God is God? Verse 23 says, But you exalted yourself against the Lord of heaven, and they have brought the vessels of his house before you and your wives and your concubines, and have been drinking wine from them, and you have praised the gods of silver, gold, and bronze, and iron, and wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or understand, but God in whose hand are your life breath and your ways you have not glorified. You shouldn't have went and got them out of the storehouse. You brought them in here and made a mockery of them. Galatians 6, God is not mocked. Whatever you sow, you shall reap. If you sow the flesh from the slept flesh, you shall reap corruption, death. But if you sow to the Spirit from the Spirit, you will reap eternal life. God will not be mocked. You're like, well, he's mocked all the time. Yes, in this case, he's going to answer it fast. Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts, he answered it fast. But just because he doesn't answer it fast in your case, 
doesn't mean that it isn't going to get answered. And I wonder if Belshazzar thinks, oh, this is just what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. He got the warning from Daniel, and God gave him 12 months to get his house in order. Remember that? In the last week, 12, or not two weeks ago now, 12 months. And he said, well, maybe he's going to give me 12 months. Spoiler alert, he doesn't get 12 months. It's not even 12 hours he gets. God will never be mocked. We will answer. Either by ourselves, with whatever we've done, or we will answer standing behind the blood of Christ. I want to be standing behind the blood of Christ. He says, you are worshiping gods who can't hear or understand, talk, anything. And you have mocked the very God whose breath is in your hand. That's a bad omen. His breath, your breath, is literally in his hand. And then he says, verse 24, Then the hand was sent from him with this inscription. The hand in whose holds your breath came to write you a message. And your breath's about to be done. Verse 25, now this is the inscription that was written out. Many, many, tekel, yefarsin. This is the interpretation of the message. Many, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found deficient. Peres, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persian. Remember the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had? the gold head of the statue, the silver, and the bronze, and then a mingling. We are past the silver and the bronze, and now we're getting into the divided kingdom of Mede and Persian. You're done, is what he just told him. you got to give Belshazzar credit. He still gave orders to clothe Daniel with purple and put a necklace around his neck, and then issued a proclamation, verse 29, concerning him, that he had now had authority as the third ruler in the kingdom, which really didn't matter because it was about to be done. Verse 30, that same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was slain. So Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. Age of 62. But I'm not going to tell her age. That was the Mede's age. That's all I'm saying. I'm in trouble now. So... It was divine. I, what can you do about that? Um, the lessons here are astronomical. God is able to take down the government at any moment, or any force, not just the government, any force opposed against you. He can bring it down at any moment, or he will walk with you through your opposition, through your occupation, while you're in the realm of darkness. Now, see, the Medes and the Persians have been pressing in on the Babylonians for some time, and history says that there was a gate that had water running into it, into Babylon, and then armies couldn't get under it because with the armor and everything, they had to go underwater, and it was just way too dangerous. And so the Medes and the Persians actually built a partial dam upstream, diverted some of the water so that the water was low enough that they could actually walk with their head above water, get under the gate, they went into the city, and they went in that night, uh, it's the, the date is set when this happened, and Darius went in and he killed uh, Belshazzar and took over the kingdom. Now, the point I want to make by telling you that is this. Belshazzar had no idea his, his kingdom of evil was going to end that night, but what you need to understand is that God was already working a plan months and months and months ahead of that and bringing the Medes and Persians in to put an end to his evil. And the problem is he didn't see that and didn't know that, and the same is true of you. You do not see, you do not know what God is doing to bring about a blessing to you during your time of trouble. We just don't always see it. But what I want us to hear today is God is absolutely aware of every issue in your life, and he is not unconcerned about it, even though we may not see him answering the way we want. Another thing I want you to understand from the story. Even though those vessels 
that had been taken from the temple, which God allowed, they had been taken from their place of holiness where they should have been and put in a place where they should not have been, even though they had been moved, they were no less sacred to Father. Now what does that mean? You also are his vessel. And you also may be in a place in your life that is certainly not the Holy of Holies or the temple. We again are living in a foreign land, the scripture says, and in a realm controlled by the prince of the power of the air, the realm of darkness that we're in, and we think, well, why would God let us be here? We must not be sacred to him. Mm -mm, mm -mm. Those vessels, though they were not where they were supposed to be, were still sacred to him, and when they defiled them, God stood up and acted. You are a vessel that God considers sacred and precious and holy. And in this life or the life to come, you will be vindicated. Daniel always seemed to be the last resort. And Daniel represented God. Why We do that too. We get sick, we have problems, we go to the doctor, we go to here and there, and then if all else fails, oh, well, let's see what God has to say. Don't do that. But Daniel was, Daniel's kind of Jesus to them. If they needed help from the God of gods, they would go to Daniel to get the word, and Jesus was that. And the, the queen mother says, look, there's a guy that can, he can, he can help you out. You remember Jesus when he started his ministry? He's at the woman at the well, and, and he says, you know, can you draw me some water? And if you had known who I was, I would have given you some water, and you'd never thirst again. And, and he says, finally, he says, go get your husband. She says, oh, I, I, don't, I don't have a husband. He says, you're right, you don't. You've had five, and the one you're with is not your husband. And she's like, I'm not playing cards with you, right? And she goes into town and she says, you need to come out and see this man who told me everything about me. He knew all of it. That's because the spirit that was in Daniel is the same spirit that was in Christ and, and God was speaking through him. And Jesus is our Daniel in this realm. When we're in trouble by the forces around us, he is the one we go to and teaches us all that we need. History shows that every nation rises and falls. Every nation rises and falls. Every power comes and goes. And the only thing that lasts forever is Jesus. I want to read a small quote to you from a, a gentleman named Malcolm Muggridge. What an awesome name that is. And uh, he was an amazing writer. And, and just listen to this. He says, we look back upon history, and what do we see? Emperor, empires rising and falling, revolutions and counter-revolutions, wealth accumulating and then dispersed, one nation dominant and then another. Shakespeare speaks of the rise and fall of great ones and the ebb and flow with the moon. In one lifetime, he, Malcolm says, I've seen my own countrymen ruling over one quarter of the world, meaning Britain. Remember? The sun never sits on the British Empire. That's where claim to fame. They controlled a huge amount of this globe. And so he says, in my lifetime, I see my own countrymen ruling over a quarter of the world, the great majority of them convinced in the words of what is still a favorite song that, quote, God who made them mighty would make them mightier yet. I have heard a crazed, cracked Austrian proclaim to the world the embellishment of a German Reich that would last for a thousand years. An Italian clown announced that he would restart the calendar to begin with his own assumption of power. A murderous Georgian brigand in the Kremlin acclaimed by the intellectual elite of the Western world as wiser than Solomon, more enlightened than Asaka, more humane than Marcus Aurelius. All in one lifetime. All gone with the wind. England now part of an island off the coast of Europe and threatened with dismemberment and even bankruptcy. 
Hitler and Mussolini dead and remembered only in infamy. Stalin, now a forbidden name in the regime he helped to found and dominated for more than some three decades. All in one lifetime. All in one lifetime. All gone. Gone with the wind. I think that is the message of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar tried everything he could do to expand his kingdom and hold on to power. It ends. Belshazzar, same thing. Mussolini, Hitler, Stalin, Osama bin Laden, whoever it may be. How many people think, I am going to create this great thing? In your own lifetime, we can name names. All gone. The, the teaching of Daniel is, this world is not the important thing. Whatever you're trying to build here, it's nice, it's wonderful to do that. But it will end. You will end. But Christ does not end, and those who are with him do not end. Our life should be built in investing and seeking after the one true God and through his son, Jesus Christ, because that kingdom will never end. He said, Belshazzar, you're done tonight, brother. I don't want to be third in your realm. Your realm is over. Remember Jesus talking to the rich young ruler? He's building bigger barns and more barns and this and that. And he says, you fool, don't you know tonight your soul's required of you? If the best laid plans you got today, you know are going to end, why don't we invest in what we know won't end? And that is Jesus Christ. We don't have time to look at it, but if you want to look at Revelation 18, Babylon comes to an end in one day again in the future. Babylon being the symbol of all that is evil in this world. And he uses this whole idea of the cup of drinking wine. And it says in, in Revelation 14, 16, and 18, he says, Babylon, you used to take the cup of passion and, and lust, and you would make other nations drink. And then he tells the angel, you take another cup, fill it twice as full, and I'm going to make Babylon drink. You will drink the destruction that you brought on so many. The world rulers of evil in this present time, they will also die. Their kingdoms will also end. And eventually, Christ will stand on this earth and rule over the nations forever. That's what you need to focus on. God is already laying the plans. Belshazzar had no idea they were draining the river under his gate. I'm telling you, the angelic armies are draining the river under the gates of the enemies of this world, of the church of this world. And they are coming, and I think they're coming soon. Just waiting for the, the trumpet call of Christ and to lead that invasion. You need to be on the right side of that history. You need to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Worship team, come on up. My five-year-old granddaughter told me the other day, there are two kinds of people, tuna and peanut butter, and tuna are on the wrong side of history. I don't know what that means. <laughs> don't be on the wrong side. I just look at her and I'm like, where do you get this stuff? Anyway. You need to choose. There's a lot of reasons not to. And as I say all the time, none of them are any good. God's not thinking, oh, I might come back someday and send my son, or I probably should start working on a plan. Acts chapter 1, verse 8 says, It is not for you to know the day that the Father has fixed, past tense, of when it's coming. The plan's already made, the water's being diverted. The end of this age is on its way, and Christ is your answer. And here's the beautiful thing. It's not just about this great battle at the end between good and evil. The blessings of peace that he'll bring you right now in the midst of your struggle. He wants to come and give you hope. He wants to love on you and give you strength when you don't have your own. 
If you're ready to make that decision, we ask you to come forward as we sing our closing song. Heavenly Father, there are some here today that just feel like the forces of darkness are just surround them and the battles that they're raging just seem overwhelming sometimes, either it's in the heart or the mind or the spirit, Lord. And just speak into their spirit today that you are there with them. You have their back. You are their rock and their fortress. And Lord, you are not absent and are working out a plan and that we can trust you. Father, we thank you for the message of Daniel. And Lord, help us now, particularly now with the darkness that has happened in our community, that we will be the light that we need to be in this realm of darkness, that they will see Jesus in us. Lord, I want that to be real and to quit fooling around with things that are only going to last about 70 years for us. And let's invest in the things that last forever. Let's rock the kingdom of God within hope of the name of Jesus. That's our prayer. We pray together in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Thank you.